What does McDougal have to say on protein? I'm going to watch some of his video. I'm going to watch some of this video because it ties in with the exercise. Everybody thinks exercise and protein go together. This originally was supposed to be what McDougal says about white food. I could not find it on his channel. So if it's on Chef AJ's channel, her and I have had kind of a past. Um, I'll check, but I don't, I don't know if I want to do that because, yeah. So let's um, let's see what this has to say, and then I'm going to go over to the protein one. Anyway, this is Ryan over High Carb Generator. Welcome to my channel. All right, so if you really want to get the actual answers from this video, they're toward the end of the video. I will probably put a uh, a timestamp down in the description section down below, but it is worth watching the whole thing just because you got to get some of the information first before you can get to the finale. But anyway, if you just want to skip to when it, when it really gets uh, juicy, I guess um, I'll put a timestamp down below. Thanks for watching. I would have to agree with that statement. A hundred percent. I make a living off prescribing exercise, but when people come to me and they say, I want to hire you to lose weight. I always talk to them in conjunction with that about their diet because there's no question that you will make greater progress with weight loss by modifying the food you put into your body than you will by exercising alone. I don't really believe that. Most Those are some nice uh, potatoes he's got back there. What is that, broccoli? Uh, light setup. I got to do something like that. Most people can pay no attention to their diet and exercise it off. So I would highly recommend doing both, right? You enhance... The weight loss by... See, he's, he, I interrupted him. Let's get back to it. Let's go back. Weight loss by modifying the food you put into your body than you will by exercising alone. I don't really believe that most people can pay no... Yeah, if you do the mathematics, the amount of calories that you burn, and I, I hate that word. The en energy is a much better because calories is just so... Mm, it's just so... Not even relevant. Um, and everybody's like, how can you say that? How can you say that? But I mean, you really don't know how much calories are in each thing that you eat. You'd have to test every single one and you don't know how much you actually use. You don't know how much you burn. You don't know how much, you don't know any of this stuff. Even Oprah, the billionaire couldn't even figure it out. And she had scientists in her house for like a month or something like that. So, I mean, it's just, it's it's really hard to figure out but if you if you figure out how much you burn and how how much you need to replenish you know or how much you actually burn in like an hour of walking it's it's like it's like a couple potatoes no attention to their diet and exercise at all so i would highly recommend doing both right you enhance the weight loss by burning off more calories than you consume but when you mm. That is such an outdated model. I did that model for years and my weight kept going up, up, up. It's kind of like Weight Watchers, right? You can, you can, like, I, I know somebody who texted me the other day. They're like, yeah, I was on Weight Watchers. I would starve myself all Friday so I could have four pieces of pizza at night. Now that, that fits within the SECO re uh, requirements, but she kept getting fatter. I mean, it, th this whole thing's got to go. You begin to eat a starch-based diet where the calories are dilute and you can eat a lot more food to where you're satisfied. You still end up taking in less calories and you end up burning more calories than you consume. And that's the only way to lose weight is to no. use more than you eat. No, it's just not. Your hormones have to do that. I mean, it's just ridiculous. This is... This is that vicious cycle that you get on that has you a dieter the rest of your life. Trust me, 20 years in. All right, this is uh, McDougal. All right, so before I even get started, I, I, I always get comments about how old McDougal looks or now they're attacking Heather, his daughter. I mean, aging is just like you see people who like for my, my mother and my father, for example, they don't follow any of this kind of stuff and they look very young for their age. But then some people that I know don't, 
You know, I used to, when I worked at the uh, the fish place, I mean, some of them guys, I, there was this dude, I thought he was like in his like 50s and I found out he was like 27 and I'm like, bro, I mean, he's always smoking the cigarettes, eating nothing, but I mean, it's just, you just never know. Protein. My name's Heather McDougall, CEO of the McDougal <laughs> program, Dr. McDougall's daughter and your mother. I'm never going to watch this whole thing. What is this? Two hours? I just wanted to get the gist. It's usually he gets his point out in the first however many minutes, and then it's questions after that. Right here today. So just a little housekeeping before we get started. This is being recorded and will be posted on our YouTube channel, so you can watch it later. And please share this important message with family and friends. We have two sessions today. Dr. McDougall will start both out with a talk on protein, followed by a Q&A. And we want to. That's usually how it works. Hopefully, the Q and A is longer because, and then maybe I can dissect that some other time. But I just I don't want this to be a, like a three hour video. Hear from you. We want to answer your questions on protein. So please type those in the Q and A, and we'll get to as many as we possibly can. Okay, now I would like to introduce the person is responsible for initiating this mastermind, our host and my father, Dr. John McDougall. Oh hi, hi welcome. Dad. Yeah, good to good to talk to you. Uh, I can't think of any better person to share this message with. You know, you have a, a, a rather non-medical, non-dietetic nutritionist point of view. And if I can get this message across to you, not that you don't have a, a good understanding or a high level of intelligence, then I should be able to get it across to the rest of the audience. And that's what I'm going to try and do. I'm going to share with people the thoughts that I have about protein, and they're all backed by science. Uh, the problem is, is people get a, a little bit of information and they expand it based upon their own life into a message. They use bro science, kind of like me. That they live by. And unfortunately, that message is sometimes very harmful to them and to the planet. So let's, uh, let's, uh, let me show you some thoughts that I put together. And there we are. So the first part of this session, I want to point out before we even get started, because I did keto for a really long time, but I, I, I did, you know, I, I never really did bodybuilding, but I did weightlifting, powerlifting. Um, I don't think I ever went above, even no matter how much I was eating, I don't think I ever went above 200 grams a day, which is ridiculous. People nowadays are trying to get up to like even more than that. I'm like, I had, I know I've said this like three or four times, but I had this woman, we were friends until this uh, kind of friend, acquaintances. Um, she, she's like, yeah, she texted me. She's like, um, yeah, I'm going to, I'm up in my proteins to 150 grams a day. I'm like 150 grams. Why? I need the energy. It doesn't give you energy. Well, yeah, I feel it. No. Oh yeah, well I I wasn't even eating that when I was lifting way more weight than most people can even uh, think of. Why I I don't why? And she's well, she's one that's always trying to lose weight. Protein is anabolic. This morning I'm going to talk to you about protein needs, protein deficiency. I'm going to talk to you about the harms of of believing that protein is the most important nutrient for us to consume. We'll talk about that this afternoon. Another thing you see is when you watch these survival shows, all they talk about is protein, protein. Got it. You got to kill this animal, get the protein from it. It's like, dude, there's like potatoes right over here and you're eating an animal. I, you got to turn that protein into carbohydrate. Afternoon. <clears throat> uh, believing that people suffer from protein deficiency is a deadly lie. And I'm here to slay King Protein and this misinformation has caused so much harm to people. Uh, and as I say, eventually it's going to be our, our end. Uh, here as a doctor, I run into all kinds of problems taking care of people because, because they believe so much in protein. Of course, protein means that you have to eat the rich Western diet. A, a typical situation that I've run into uh, with 12,000 people that I've taken care of is they get sick 
And for example, some of my patients have had heart attacks and they've not wanted to repeat the experience. You can imagine. You wonder why? Um, uh, uh, a family, a wife and her husband get into a situation where he uh, is threatened by a, a life-changing event, like a closure of one of his heart arteries. I mean, the misinformation shut my kidneys. In, well, not completely. I don't want to be an extremist. I started smelling like ammonia and my back was hurting all the time, like a lower back all, all the time. I remember one time I was taking these um, these supplements. It was some kind of, uh, I, I don't even remember what it was, but it was even more protein than I was usually eating. And my kidneys were hurting so bad. I was at a, I was at a uh, bank job at that time. I couldn't actually get out of my chair to greet people. That's how bad my kidneys were starting to hurt. Ends up in the hospital, <clears throat> has heart surgery. The wife, trying to protect her loving husband, says, doctor, we're, we're going to not eat the way we used to eat. We're going to change to a vegetarian diet. And unfortunately, because of the medical profession's ignorance about diet and human nutritional needs, the response from the doctor is, you can't do that, ma'am. Your, your husband's going to become a nutritional disaster. He's going to protein deficient fall apart. You won't have enough protein. It's it's crazy. It's crazy to me because when I was getting on the keto train before, I don't even think it was called keto back then and back in the day. It was like some things that, that they were talking about in the muscle mags. And I'm like, sounds good to me. The doctors were like, do not do this. Do not you do not do this. And now, man, they're they're pumping out that 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 keto like crazy. Ironically, the doctor that told me not to do keto ended up doing keto, got cancer, and died on Christmas Day two years ago. He's missing essential amino acids. What chance does the uh, does the family have with this kind of misinformation, especially when the tools that are offered to the patient are a temporary fixes at best. You need to get to the source of the problem, which is the food. It's the food. And you've heard me say that so many times. So as a doctor, I'm, I'm very much inhibited in my ability to take care of my patients because of my colleagues' misunderstanding about- And man, everybody's, everybody's pushing their science here and there. I don't, hmm, this science thing. <laughs> I don't know what they planted in people, modern day people, like, like, you got to look for the science, got to look for the facts. You got to look. I mean, it's just like robots. It's, it's driving me crazy. Uh, nutritional needs. And of course, that's that's conveyed to the patient. Uh, a more important problem is that if I had to pick one nutrient that is threatening life on the planet, it's protein. And what we're talking about is meat intake and also dairy product intake. Uh, dairy's way i'm not promoting meat but dairy oh i lost 50 pounds a month i dropped dairy that stuff and the stuff that was coming out of me the belief that hmm. protein is our most important nutrient puts us in a situation where we're not willing or able to change to a diet that will sustain life on planet earth i love this quote from albert einstein nothing nothing will benefit human health an increased chances for survival of life on earth as much as the evolution to a vegetarian diet. Smartest man in the world had this figured out long before most of the science had ever been discussed. What we're talking about here in terms of destroying the planet by believing that we need to have all this protein, again, we're talking about animal foods, is the production of greenhouse gases. And this has been conveyed in many ways. And you see that the production of greenhouse gases is in this particular illustration, 47 times greater than the production of greenhouse gases caused by consuming potatoes. Now there's some research papers that I've seen that say the difference. As far as breathing air, yeah, I get it. But some of the other stuff, mm, I don't know. Between 
potatoes and beef in terms of environmental damage is a hundredfold. And of course, people don't believe they can eat potatoes and get all their nutrients, particularly protein. And so yeah, well, the Khan study, which you're probably going to mention right now, actually proved this. It was it was now to uh, to see if those people could actually survive on uh, pota uh, potatoes. It was to see if potatoes had enough nitrogen, which is protein, in it to keep them alive, and they thrived on it. If I remember, I'll leave the that study uh, down below. So they have to continue eating the food. But that was studies like that. I don't hate because it's clearly not funded by anybody. Some of these other ones, you know, foods that are destroying their personal health as well as the planet's health. And you know, there's uh, there's very little attention given to this uh, this important subject. Uh, there are a few young people out there protesting that we need to save the planet, that we're going to perish in, by means of global warming. But the real key players out there really haven't made the connection of diet and climate change. And I'm talking about the founder of, uh, of diet and climate change, the man who produced the documentary An Inconvenient Truth, and that's Al Gore. And I'm talking specifically about Bill Gates, who's one of our most brilliant entrepreneurs of our times. There was a 60 Minutes presentation on February 14th, 2021, where Bill Gates talked about his concern for the environment, said we would- Yeah, he also can talk about some other stuff. I'm not watching this yet. Um, standard marketing. What uh, various businesses do is they find something unique about their product, and then they advertise it to death, to the death of us, the death of- uh, This one I can buy. The, the goal is to sell you product. A hundred percent. A hundred percent. You know, it's ironic because um, ever since the beef is what's for dinner, I don't know if uh, some of the younger people who watch this might not even ever seen these, but the beef is what's for dinner, uh, pork, the other white meat, uh, got milk. Ever since those ads were out, actually the industry has been declining, but they keep trying so hard. This is a, a, a business issue. This has nothing to do with a conspiracy. It's just a matter of, of profit and loss and being successful in business. And so when you mention meat, what do people think about? Protein. And if I ask you where do you get your calcium, you'd tell me dairy and fish. Industry has been so effective with the propaganda about omega-3 fats that they've convinced you that you have to destroy the population. I still, still get people coming on this channel. Oh, well, you got to get your omega-3s. There's like no omega-6s hardly in uh, full foods whatsoever. So why would you need it? I don't know. Population of the ocean in order to be healthy and to stay alive. Well... As we've discussed before, omega-3 fats are only made by plants and fish get their omega-3 fats by eating algae and seaweed. So again, this is, this is a business issue. This has to do with economics. This doesn't have to do with the truth. These- Profit and truth rarely go together. Look how terrible that looks. Even when I ate meat, I, I wouldn't, the dried stuff, ugh, and cheese, I never really liked it all that much, especially the smell. These are the high protein animal foods that everybody seems to be focused on, the ones that are high in protein. I want you to think about these as similar foods. The solution to changing people's diets in my lifetime has been to switch from red muscle, red meat, to white muscle, such as chicken and fish. People thinking that this kind of change will- Yeah, they think it's gonna cut the cholesterol, which it doesn't. And they think it's gonna cut the fat, which, you know, everybody likes their chicken wings now. How is that cutting the fat down? Because most people fry them. Will result in improvement of their health. But what I want you to start thinking of in terms of the similarity, a muscle is a muscle is a muscle. Whether it happens to flap a wing, <laughs> wiggle a fin, or, or move a limb or close a shell. 
these are all muscles and they're similar and they're very different from plants. How, how in the world would you expect to be different in terms of your health by switching among similar foods? You won't be different. Get a bit of misinformation that keeps you from, from attaining the type of health and personal appearance that you deserve. I mean, I'm still dealing with the, I'm still dealing with these organs that really suffered. People want to claim that I'm not sticking close to the diet, that people want to claim this or that. I still deal with, I can't, I, like, for example, I can't even eat too many beans without no, it's just smelling like ammonia again. You have to, you have to eat differently to be different. And so it goes with uh, saving the planet. We have to not think of these various muscle foods as being different. And somehow when you switch from beef to chicken, you're going to be solving the problems. That's not enough. If you look at the, uh, the percent of fat of uh, various animal foods, you see they're all very similar, 50, 60, 70% fat. The protein content in terms of percent of calories is very similar. They have a similar amount of cholesterol in them. They're very, all very high in cholesterol. Cholesterol is only found in significant amounts in plant foods. Whereas if you look at plant foods like potatoes. And I was at um, Five Guys Picking Up for DoorDash the other day, and they brag about how their fried potatoes don't give you cholesterol because they use peanut oil. Carrots is still, it's still like 100% fat now. Pinto beans, you see that they're very low in fat. 50 times lower in fat. Uh, they're also relatively low in protein that contain no cholesterol at all. Same thing with dairy products. You know, dairy products are, are the secret. If one thing, if you get one thing out of watch, and if you are a carnivore, one thing that you get out of watching this, do not do dairy. You'll notice such a big difference in your life. Cretions, of course, of mammals. And people think that the way to have a better health, or some people think that the solution to their health problems or planetary problems is to, to become vegetarian. But I want you to think in terms of the similarity. Dairy is liquid meat. And compare, for example, ground chuck, beef, to cheddar cheese. About the same amount of fat, 70% fat. Similar amount of protein, about 30% protein. In the 80s, the Japanese started getting dairy. They didn't have it prior to that. They started getting dairy, and they started getting obsessed with it. Um, and these like little boutique like the ice creams and stuff like that. And they finally started having Western diseases. It took dairy in their country to, to finally get them. Virtually no carbohydrate. You know, the sugars that are in the food. No dietary fiber. Have about the same amount of cholesterol. They're liquid meat. And how would you expect to get better from switching from the muscles of animals to the secretion of mammals. It just doesn't work. I know your intentions are wonderful. You wanna get well, you wanna do the right thing, but you're given so much misinformation. And this is a worldwide issue. Uh, we, we've seen uh, big changes just in my lifetime in terms of animal product consumption and in terms of the health of people and the planet protein, much higher when it comes to animal foods and it comes to vegetable foods. So if you're just looking at a, a cost benefit ratio for you as a consumer, you want to you wanna get your protein from plant foods. If you're looking at the cost benefit ratio from the point of view of the manufacturer, the farmer. Speaking of cost, man, I go do uh, DoorDash and I pick up groceries. Man, the meat is ridiculous. I don't know how people do keto and carnivore nowadays. The person who's pr producing these high costly uh, protein sources, you know, then you wanna push the animal products. And of course, that's what industry does. Industry is interested in being profitable. Uh, it's not a conspiracy, folks. It's just what we deal with every day. And that is, you need to make enough money to pay the kids tuition, to pay your mortgage. And unfortunately, in the short-sightedness that we have, we're willing to sacrifice everything. If you go to the store, one of the uh, the primary sales. It's ironic because I would have begged for I begged for this kind of stuff back when I was doing it, and now I'm like, man, I, how wrong are it? Just takes years for you to realize just how bad it is. 
pitches to the public, to the grocery shopper, is my protein has more protein than your product. I remember uh, walking through Costco and see- I remember getting the sideways looks from people when I was used to go to restaurants back in the day about how much protein I, or animals I was eating. Now it's like you can't if you ask for extra rice, they look at you like you're crazy. And the end aisle salespeople telling me even the Chinese people. I ask for extra rice uh, if, if once in a while when I get Chinese food. Even they are starting to give me like a crazy look. I'm like, wow. You got to buy my, my candy bar because my candy bar has 30 grams of, grams of protein as opposed to the competitor's candy bar. It's only 10 or 20 grams of protein. You know, people think of protein as the most important nutrient. And of course, they have been uh, further dissuaded from the truth by the popularity of high protein diets. Because people become obese, overweight, 80% of the population in the developed world suffers from being overweight or obese. They're desperate. The only one I know on here is the Atkins. And I did that for like two weeks. I'm like, I was basically living on bacon and grapefruit juice. Lose weight. They don't understand <laughs> Who does that, that the fat you eat is the fat you wear. They don't understand that it's the food of aristocrats that makes you look like a king and a queen. And they're so desperate for a solution to their problem that they'll buy into a diet that makes them so sick that they lose their appetite and they lose weight, which is the... It'll do that 100%. That Atkins diet, I didn't even want to eat. I didn't even want to eat. You should, it's so dry. It's so dry. I was chugging grapefruit juice because that was, you know, allowed. But... Uh, Ooh. These high protein, low carbohydrate diets have been so popular over the years. Yeah, they're a quick fix. You lose six, eight, 10 pounds of water from the diuretic effect of these high protein diets. And then you become nauseated mm -hmm. because you're ill, yep. because yep. you're consuming a nutrient makeup in your diet that is so bizarre that the human body goes into a state of sickness. We call that ketosis. Let's talk about some protein basics. Uh, in I remember back in 2000, I was divorced. So it was probably 2005 or six. I started wondering if all the protein that I was eating was really a good idea. So I bought the, it's actually over here on the shelf, the Okinawa diet. But I'm like, oh, there's no way you can eat on uh, sweet potatoes and be healthy. Your food, <laughs> you have. Because of marketing five macronutrients. That means large nutrients. Uh, we're talking about the weight, the volume of the food. You have carbohydrate, protein, fat, fiber, and water. Th those, those components make up the bulk of the food. And then along with these particular macronutrients, these five basic macronutrients, you have micronutrients, which are your vitamins and minerals, and other phytochemicals, other chemicals in plants that promote good health and are, are essential for good health. And of course, we have non-nutrients in our food, such as contaminants and cholesterol. But the macronutrient that's promoted, again, to the death of all of us, is protein. Mm. It's just so toxic to the body in, in large levels. It's just so toxic. You're seeing it. How many more people are going to the hospital nowadays? Uh, you're saying, I mean, I'm, this is why I get these videos out here. You're seeing it like crazy. And then the doctors are defending the protein. <laughs> you just can't win. Uh, proteins are made of amino acids. There are 20 amino acids that make up all the proteins in nature. Just, just like uh, 26 letters make up all the words in a dictionary. Uh, just by rearranging these amino acids in different sequences and different numbers, you make all the proteins in nature. Now, these proteins are based on amino acids. And when they break down, they turn into acidic components. And there are certain amino acids that are prevalent in animal food. Why I was throwing up stomach acid every night. Yep. That are particularly dangerous, particularly acidic, and these are the ones that contain sulfur. You see the yellow ball up there. And that's why I was smelling like ammonia. 
Yep. That represents the uh, sulfur, the sulfur component of various amino acids. And two of the 20 amino acids are sulfur containing and they break down to sulfuric acid. And then we're gonna talk about this afternoon about the effect of taking in a large acid load on the body. These proteins- And this one looks like a donut. These amino acids, as I mentioned, uh, arrange in different sequences, uh, different numbers of amino acids, and they form different kinds of proteins. Like you have antibodies, which we talked a lot about in terms of uh, the recent viral infections. Uh, they form hemoglobin, which is the major component of your blood. Insulin, which controls your blood sugar. Other enzymes throughout the body and, you know, proteins that make up uh, large enzymes and also muscles. So they have various functions, but they're all based on these same 20 amino acids. And they turn into... Uh, very functional proteins that you hear about. Uh, lactase is one of the enzymes that is produced by combining the amino acids in different sequence. You have muscles, muscle, muscle components, which are collagen, made up of these same amino acids, antibodies, various pigments in the body, uh, blood components, your DNA contains uh, proteins, Also, the, uh, the iron storage part of your blood, proteins. So the body is made up of various kinds of proteins. They have different functions. So where do we go wrong? We certainly need protein. Of course. But where we went wrong on this whole protein thing was uh, animal experiments that were done in 1914. Osborne and Mendel. What they did is they discovered the basic components of protein, and they knew that they consisted of various amino acids, and they theorized that some proteins had more of these essential amino acids than other proteins. And so they started feeding various diets to rats, and they found out that rats didn't do well on plant proteins. I mean, I mean, like I said there, rats are, are not people. I don't understand why we uh, make these animals suffer because we are the only ple ple uh, anything on this planet that doesn't know what we're supposed to eat. If you added a little bit of animal protein to a rat's diet, they grew wonderfully, but, but not well. There is literally no other species of anything on this planet other than us that doesn't know what we're supposed to eat. How is that? on plant proteins. And so during my youth, we actually learned that animal proteins were class A or superior proteins. Mm. More bioavailable. And plant proteins were inferior or class B based upon rat studies. But what people didn't think about and still don't today is we're not rats. We have different nutritional needs as I'm gonna to talk to you about. I mean, I guarantee half the studies he uses are on rats. So are they legit? Now the keto warriors are going to come on here and say, yeah, I told you keto is better. Well, depending upon the animal species. Back in the 1800s, uh, there were scientists, nutritionists, and one of the most famous was uh, Carl Voigt. He was considered the father of modern dietetics, and he established protein principles that to this day are considered the Voigt standard. And he had the philosophy, as I know some of our listeners might have had in the past, that <clears throat> when you eat flesh, it turns into flesh. I mean, what could be a better thing to eat for an organism, a being made of flesh, than to eat the components of flesh? I mean, it's just logical, isn't it? And he also, back in the 1800s, he came to the conclusion that people would instinctively select the proper diet if they could afford it, if they had enough. And the people who could afford it are the ones who die early, usually. I mean, there's other external, uh, uh, you know, situation. Money. And so <clears throat> Voigt and some of the other scientists back in the 1800s, what they do, did is they looked at various populations of people people who could, could afford to eat whatever they wanted, plant foods, potatoes, beef, whatever they wanted, which were laborers. In other words, they had a job, they made money. 
and uh, other kinds of workers and people of the uh, part of society. And he noted that these people ate a high animal protein diet. And again, his, his philosophy was that we would. I think if we look at this, the people who lived in the coldest climate, other than Italian, but the French laborers, I mean, France, the Southern part isn't as hot or as cold. I mean, if you think of Sweden, you don't exactly think of the tropics. And they're like the richest country, them in Switzerland, Russia. I don't know. Mm. Stinky didn't take in the right kind of food. But I guarantee if you had some more tropical areas, the protein load would be way less. Well, at that time, people were aware that there were not many now, populations but of back people in the who day. didn't eat these high-protein animal foods. Like, for example, the, the people from rural China, rural Africa, who did very heavy labor. Uh, there were Yeah, diamond mines in Africa. There were no many vegetarians back in the 1800s, and they seemed to survive just fine on what are considered inferior proteins, plant proteins. We would instinctively choose the right food if given the option. I mean, Big just girl. look at what's going on in the world today. You know, we have a population of people where people can afford, they can afford to eat whatever they want. And do they instinctively choose the right thing? 40% of people are obese, 80% are overweight, half are pre-diabetic, a third get diabetes, half have heart attacks and strokes, and most people die prematurely based upon their free will to choose instinctively what to eat. Well, let's take a look at the science. Back in uh, the 1800s, uh, there was an opponent of Carl Voigt and he was very much against uh, people eating a high protein diet. This is a, a Danish nutritionist scientist. By the is name he the one that did some stuff? There is, and uh, that whole section of the world, there was some real potato lovers. Name of Mikhail Hinhidi, and he was very famous uh, because of his uh, prominent part in World War One. Uh, during World War One, the uh, British set up a blockade to starve the Germans in the North Sea. They set up a blockade. I think this is what I'm talking about. Denmark, which uh, lies between Britain and Germany, uh, they suffered food shortages. And what Hinhidi did is he asked the Danish population to change their diet. Instead of eating the animals that they were consuming commonly, he said, why don't we just eat the animal foods? And the population of Danes during World War I, three million people, didn't suffer from hunger nope. as compared to the Germans who believed in a well-rounded diet to make sure you get enough protein where there are 400,000 deaths from malnutrition during the period of 1914 to 1918. And that's crazy. I mean, there's more casualties of war from starvation than from uh, gun guns. The Danes actually developed the low war is nothing but a money maker most all things ridiculous of disease that they've ever experienced between 1914 and 1918 the incidence of disease dropped 34 percent in a time when people consumed a low protein diet well he had been doing experiments uh back in the 1800s where he put people on various kinds of diets for example uh, Madsen was one of his experimental subjects. And he asked Madsen to eat a diet of basically there potatoes you go. That for is, a whole year. Shit, I'm in the way. And he, um, Let me figure out how to move me. I'll be right back. All right, this is the most important part of this entire video, <laughs> 40 minutes in. Minimum need of protein was so low for man that it could not be reached. Therefore, removing meat would be of no adverse consequence. Hopefully you made it this far. That is the most important part of this video by far. It was in excellent health. He also did experiments with people eating only grains for a year and had no protein deficiency. And back in the late 1800s, 
the science showed, as it does today, that the minimal need for protein was so low for man that it could not be reached. And so when he was de designing the diet for the Danes to survive World War I without any suffering, at a time when they had plenty of food and disease decreased by 34%, he wasn't worried about getting enough protein. Back over 100 years ago, 120 years ago, people realized that it was impossible to design a protein deficient diet. Russell Henry Chittenden, he was a, again a critic of Carl Voigt and the idea that you needed to eat all this protein to be healthy. And he thought, he thought, and he stated in his paper, he said that uh, you need to, re he, the critics were reversing cause and effect. People did not become rich because they ate more protein, but they ate meat and other expensive high protein foods because they had already attained an income sufficient to afford. That's just like well, all the he, royals he the and all the of, other uh, stuff. That has been the, the thing this whole time, high off the hog, you know, all these terms go to suggest that these people who are eating this way were already rich. You know, I know Pritikin talks about in, in the ancient Egyptian days, the the royalty back then, once when they get would get to a really sick point, they would put them on the peasant food and they would get better. And then they would go back to eating. And But that constant back and forth, and most of them didn't live very long, especially in Egypt. I mean, some of them were in their early 20s when they died. Biochemistry at Yale. And he started doing some experiments. And everybody wants to say it's because of how rough things were back then or blah, 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 blah. But, but why was everybody else but the royals living a normal lifespan? And uh, because of his fear of uh, developing protein deficiency, he started with himself as a subject. That's quite an outfit. And he went on a diet that contained a third to a half as much protein as the typical person in the United States was consuming at that particular time. And he, he survived. Not only did he survive, he said that his constant nausea, feeling of nausea went away, his achy knees disappeared. But he was still concerned because everybody believed you need to eat all these animal foods and all this protein. Well, he cautiously proceeded on in his experimentation of protein needs. And instead of just looking at, uh, at what other people ate, he actually did experiments that included careful dietary histories and checking the amount of protein and protein byproducts in the urine. Well, his next set of subjects was uh, five Yale faculty. And they had the same response to cutting their protein intake in half or more. And then he did 13 Hospital Corps U.S. Army I mean, men who were physically very active. I immediately started healing. Immediately started healing as soon as, soon as I dropped the meat. Um, immediately. I didn't smell like ammonia anymore. I wasn't throwing up stomach acid. Um, what else? I mean, I was, I was throwing up worms and stuff like that. And everybody's like, well, detox isn't real. Okay. Well, I saw the worms coming out of both ends. It does. And they also responded with better health. They got rid of many of their chronic conditions. And then he went to the Yale athletes, the, the, the high performers, the, the runners, the endurance athletes. I remember telling Sandy, like, I could not believe what I just seen come out of me. And, and of course, I mean, nobody wants to see it. So I didn't show it to her, but wow, that meat stuff is bad. And I was getting the best beef you could get. You know, the grass fed and whole foods. And, I mean, it, it was it was costly. And he put them on this diet that was considered unhealthy because it was deficient in protein. And they likewise improved. In fact, they on that subject. And I know I keep interrupting and nobody's going to be able to even figure out what's happening. I will link this video down below. But on that subject, when we used to get fish in that had worms, which was fairly often when I worked at the fish place. All we would do is we would send that stuff down to be made into fish patties. So you're eating it. I know you're eating. I mean, we didn't process uh, meat, beef or anything like that, but it's, it's, uh, it's in the patties.
It's in the hot dogs. It's in the whatever else, you know, process. It's in the McDonald's. It's in all this stuff. You're eating it. Improve their athletic abilities by about 35%. The uh, next most important pioneer along the way of development of science was William Rose. And uh, William Rose discovered the last two amino acids. Now, I told you there are 20 amino acids. He discovered the last two of the amino acids. And <clears throat> he asked some very basic questions. I always thought was there a, was 22. In a, in a situation, he was a professor of biochemistry at the University of Illinois. And he had a, a very willing student population who wanted to be involved in these experiments uh, because they got a dollar a day. And they also got their initials printed in Rose's widely spread publications. They, they became famous by just being part of his experiments. Well, William Rose, he, he asked these students to eat a, a diet that was considered low in protein. He found out that they needed very little protein in their diet. And then what he did is because the 20 amino acids were known, and at that time, Researchers knew that uh, animals like rats could make 10 of the essential amino acids. Essential being you had to get... A oh, we made 14. I don't know. Some of these numbers sound wrong from my bro and protein days. From, from the food, they could make 10 of the essential amino acids. Rats could, but they couldn't make the other 10 of the essential amino acids. So they had to get them from the food. Well, he wanted to see if that... Uh, translated into his human subjects, his students. And so he made a mixture of, uh, of uh, cornmeal without protein in it. He uh, added a few vitamins and minerals, plenty of calories. And then he slowly withdrew each of the amino acids that had been found to be essential for the development of healthy rats. And he found out that people were two amino acids more efficient than rats. We could make 12 of the 20 essential amino acids, but we couldn't make. I don't think that's right. I don't think that's, I, th I think it's 14 and we need eight because there's 22. I could be wrong, but I mean, I, I was in the protein game for a, a long time, unless that's just more the, you know, marketing. Like eight of them, they had to be found in our food. So William Rose, he, uh, he did the classic experiments on his subjects, and he determined what the minimum amino acid requirement was for each of his subject. And whatever subject required the most amino acids, he called that the minimum amino acid requirement of each student. Well, whoever required the most before they developed agitation, extreme hunger, signs of deficiency, of protein deficiency. That particular subject was- uh, I don't know. I, I think this is getting a little, little scientific now. I'm going to link this down below. I think this is long enough. I think you got your answer. I know it took a little while to get to the answer, but this is a very beneficial video for anybody who is in any kind of ill health and or wants to prevent themselves from getting into ill health and having to deal with some of the stuff that those of us who have been down this road for quite a few years are dealing with now. Anyways, comments, questions, whatever, down below, like, subscribe, uh, share the video, and I think that's about it. If you really want me to watch the second half of this, let me know. I don't mind doing it. I just... I know people check out and I just don't want people checking out. So anyways, talk to you next time.